fastest two. So this is chapter one of the book. Um, and we start, I wish we had like a running scroll or something, but we're going to start off with sort of like a little micro, uh, what do you call it, an intro. Some time has passed since the dark sentence has faded in closure. An event branded by the astonishing escape of a pair of old flames with a spark set off between them once again. They set course to seek asylum beyond the gates of a free world buried in rumor, a place once spoken about in hopeful tones through the spice night air on Marisin when they were young, a nearly mythical world called Furanak. But the green fantasies of the unhindered rarely align with the desideratum that comes with age. A faint whisper of impending change had risen with the flicker of their rekindled infatuation. There would be a third. This story finds us some time later, earmarked in the turbulent aftermath of suspended dreams and uncertainty, on the heels of an extraordinary and confounding arrival. Chapter <laughs> one. Have you gained entry yet? A metallic voice sounded through the communication link on Mia's polished black tactical jumpsuit and across the never-ending caramel sand of Crochet, a parched desert planet retained for research by the houses of the Star Supremacy. Nostrand watched her visibly relax at the sound of the droid's programmed tone, sterile but comforting. He wished he could pull up even a fraction of her optimism on a day like today. She stepped over one of the two motionless bodies lying in the golden dust at their feet. Her confectionery green hair glinting reflected light as she bowed her head ever so slightly down toward them. A silent apology. No strand knew that men hadn't done anything wrong. They had simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Scientists on their way home for the day who'd seen the couple approaching, who had asked too many questions, the wrong ones. When they'd attempted to contact security on their device, the couple were left with no other option but to knock them out. Thank the stars for the immobility setting on Mia's phaser. It had saved them more than a few times. The unconscious scientist would wake up eventually. I feel like I should be looking at you. <laughs> I'm really putting myself in the mood. Oh. But he knew Mia still felt bad. It confounded him how, despite the horrors she'd seen in the depths of the dark sentencer, bodies crumbling to ruins, starvation harrowing enough for human beings to turn on one another, endless pain. There remained a vulnerable space inside of her. She'd been ground and pressed into something harder than she was before, but Mia had never turned to stone. Relax, 51, we're on our way, she replied. A brief refresher then. Remember to access westward, third pipe from the left only. The coordinates are 8918E. No stand leading to Mia's collar, intercepting the conversation. Third from the left was good enough, 51. Just keep the freckles safe in the sky and close, all right? We'll alert when we secure the target. He looked up at the A-frame superstructure in the distance, shaped like a trepper crow flipped on its back and drowning in Jotho steel. Cross for Biopharmaceutical Therapeutic Research, CBTR, a facility privately owned by House Docs, the most industrious of the five houses. As far back as he could remember, Nostrand had loved architecture. Even as a boy cutting his teeth in a metropolis, there had been a particular skyscraper downtown he always found himself meandering to, taking a long way home to stand in the monumental shadow that it cast, peering up to commit angle to memory. He could probably sketch the building out if someone asked. Mighty pillars to the left and right, discs of stone at the corners hollowed carefully into mandalas, a high turret cut out against the Marisin sky. No strand remembered the design, every detail. Yet, he couldn't recall the purpose of the building. Perhaps he considered, he never bothered to know. Today it would be different. He felt with conviction as he stood before the long, clean lines in the distance that one thing was certain. Even if he lived a thousand lifetimes, he wouldn't forget what this structure might mean for him, for them. It held a chance. He sensed Mia's eyes on him and her slender hand at the base of his neck, beneath the heavy mass of hair that had grown unapologetically wild while they'd been on the run. We can do this, Nose. He nodded his hand. I know. Where there's a will, there's a way out, right? Exactly, she said softly. YML. The sound of her speaking those three letters pulled out a tight-lipped smile from the man chewing on the inside of his cheek 
an old nervous habit making a reappearance lately. They looked back up at the facility, where on opposite ends of the structure, a scaly white calcification had built up over time, where steam and noxious aerosol chemicals were released out of the lab through a network of large metallic waste tubes. Some of the tubes were delegated for hazardous components only, engaging a complicated filtration synthesis upon release. Those were the ones to avoid. The pair approached the ducts, locating the steam exhaust. In his research, ARC-51 had discovered the system at CBTR was auto-programmed to deregulate and self-clean twice daily, though he couldn't locate what those trends were. Climbing inside would cost them their lives if the exhaust were released, instantly steaming the flesh from their bones like boiled meat. But as they had discussed a thousand times before, risk was something they were comfortable with when the payoff could be life-changing. Nostrand placed his hand on the outside of the pipe, feeling for some indication that the self-clean sequence had happened recently. It was warm, but not hot. It didn't mean much. He kissed Nia on the face just before placing an accompanying Haas guard helmet on his head, then grabbed onto the side of the duct, his biceps rounding as he pulled his body weight up into the gaping shaft. Nia followed suit, keeping close behind, lifting herself onto a very shallow ledge at the perimeter of the duct. The humidity hit them both like a hot ocean, glistening pearls of perspiration forming over their faces under the helmets the second they entered. To no strand surprise, the service ladder scaled up the inside of the tube and they quickly started the uneasy climb, keeping an eye on the lid for any signs of the release cycle starting up. Are you guys? No. <laughs> Fortunately, as they neared the small maintenance hatch halfway up, there were no surprises. No strand cracked open the soldered hatch just enough to get a look at what they were about to walk into. Beyond the hatch stood a small maintenance room, methodically organized consoles filled with tools and supplies lining every wall. The lights were off, and No strand hoped this was a sign that work in the lab had indeed finished for the day. He pushed carefully through the hatch, holding it open to Nia for safety. If 51 schematic is exact, the trial chamber should be only six doors down from this location headed east, Mia said, as she scanned the wall of cleaning supplies looking for something. A bin of trash caught her eye in the corner. She grabbed a pair of discarded rubber gloves from the top. You steal and garbage again? She smirked. Watch and learn, buddy. Beyond the door was an imposing corridor, plated floor to ceiling in sterile cold metal, an aseptic smell in the air as Nia and Nostrand ran down the hallway, eyes darting in all directions of the very low light provided solely by strips of hygienic white lights installed down the center of the floor. He mentally counted the mounting sets of polished double doors, adrenaline furthering their focus until they came to the sixth, marked Biocompatibility Lab. Nostrand looked to Nia for confirmation. This it? Only one way to find out. She pulled the gloves from her pocket, gently pressing the fingertips up to the access scanner adjacent to the doors. Without warning, a framed lighted panel surrounding the entryway illuminated blue, and the doors pivoted open. Mia gave no strand an I told you so glance as she strolled inside. The laboratory was long, linear and expansive. Overhead, through an equally rectangular skylight, the cinnamon warmth of crow shift twilight cast deepening shadows across rows of cages and aquariums. Part of the reason House Docks had chosen this planet to headquarter a research facility was the access to a multitude of native animals to test on, some rare enough to become the stuff of folklore. Columns of tragically unfortunate creatures scurried in fear into the corners of their enclosures, their palpable dread filling the room. Nia turned away from them, and Nostrand knew she was unable to look. Since becoming a mother, he noticed the helplessness of both children and animals struck her in a different way. No strand soft spot for strays, though, that was nothing new. One rather amicable subject, a carbon euro, approached the edge of its crate, curious about the newcomers. It extended its furry black snout through the crack in the bars, sniffing the air, two coin-sized eyes beseeching them to open the fastener. Nia kept walking as No strand, a few feet behind, Unbeknownst to her, removed a tiny periwinkle amphibian from its cage and tucked it safely into his pack. He pointed out the cold chest in the middle of the aisle where the biologics were stored. Here we go, she trailed off. No strand caught up as she opened the heavy lid of one of the chests, revealing a legion of small glass vials, clear, yellow, and ten different shades of red. 
We have to take one of everything, right? Yep. Can't imagine getting another chance in here, and I don't think we'll forgive ourselves if we don't try every last one. Let's load them up then, he said, opening up another compartment of the pack as he started to pull out one delicate vial at a time, placing them in cryotubes for safety. Through the tiny clinks of glass and otherwise disinfected echoic quiet of the lab, a growl reverberated without warning. It was not a sound that could even be placed as a noise, per se, but rather a tremor that pulsed through the vials in the ground where the couple stood. It seized and shook their eardrums, a sudden phonic volcanic eruption. The couple looked up toward the other far end of the room where a door had been jostled open by the vibration. What the hell was that? She whispered. Nothing I've ever heard before, Nostrand said, pulling a blaster out from his hip. Keep filling the bags up and I'll go see about it. He started to follow the wave of the growl while it washed through the lab once more. The test subjects rattled in their pens. Mia cringed but kept loading up her pack with the pre precious medications. As Nostrand walked slowly, quieting his steps out of habit and craning his neck to catch a glimpse of whatever monstrosity was making the sound. Beyond the open door was an expansive, theater-sized enclosure, sunk in about two stories down. Green lights pulsed silently in rhythm all around. He hadn't noticed them before, but recognized the lights as perimeter marks of a force field, making sure whatever was down there stayed there. Otherwise, it was pitch black inside. Unable to contain his intrigue, Nostrand entered the vestibule, squinting around against the darkness until he was gobsmacked by the phosphorescent assault of a hundred pairs of legs the size of old trees, illuminating like ruby bolts of lightning below. Nostrand fell back, slamming his head on an emergency deactivation switch on the metal wall. The switch had a protective cover on it, fortunately, but the sound startled the beast even further. Its body flashed in warning, and the horrible thing let out another reactionary snarl. No chance could nearly feel it in his fingernails. Nia, you won't believe this, but I think there's a scolarusia in a giant tank over here, and it does not appear happy. You're kidding, she said, looking up from the cold chest for a half second. I don't think I am. Holy shit, you gotta see this thing. Almost finished, just grabbing this last one. She stretched and reached to pull one final Xanath vial out of the storage, holding the chilled glass up to him for, to see, as if it were a manifested prayer. Nia wrapped the vial in a protective layer with the others and secured the pack on her body. She buzzed R51 from her collar piece, grabbing Nostrand's pack from the table. 51, we've acquired the biologics. Stand by at the origin point in approximately 10. Fluorescent red flashes from the Scolarusia flickered into Nostrand's eyes. His stocky brow crumpled against the light. Nia pressed the bag to Nostrand's chest. Incredible. Her voice trailed off as she stared at the enormous creature. I can't remember even seeing an image of one before. Not that it would have done it justice. Pretty unreal, Nostrand said. I can't believe how loud it is. Are your ears ringing? Yep. Dare I say it feels worth it? Nia inched closer to the perimeter. My father used to include Scolarusias in his bedtime stories. Did I ever tell you that? He would say they would grow the size of a spacecraft, and they could paint the night sky scarlet with their rage, even possess human intelligence. I always assumed it was proof of his weakness for hyperbole, but here we are. I feel bad for the thing trapped in there like that, Nostrand said, sad. Nia started to exit the vestibule. I get it, Nos, but we gotta go. The freckle's waiting for us. Let's... Kum, 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 kum. The sound of a dozen armed medical guards barreling into the laboratory stole the words from her throat. The couple fell silent, tucked into the vestibule of the Solarusia's observation deck, trying to stay out of the line of sight from the lab entrance. Despite the deliberations and precaution they had taken to audit the facility, Nostrand silently wondered if their plan had been too reckless. Maybe they shouldn't have come at all. He could hear the guards inching around the testing room investigating, charged 728 blasters very likely drawn. One of them spoke into a communication device, reporting the alarm. Reporting response to a trial laboratory entry alarm at ingress number 3067, on site and sweeping perimeter. Their footsteps were coming closer to the open doors 
As they approached, the flashing of the force field perimeter cast enough unwanted light on the couple to get them away. The guards raised their blasters high in unison toward them. State your names and your function in this facility, soldiers. You got this, Mia, no strength thought. His girl was usually on her toes in a pinch. I am here to inspect the labs on behalf of house docs, Mia said, stuttering slightly. Remove your helmet, soldier, and as requested, state your name at once. She hesitated again, and before the guard could move to call them into the headquarters on his communication device, Nostrand pulled the emergency switch, disabling the electrified perimeter that kept the creature in. There was a series of panicked movements as the guards realized what the intruder had done, and the Solarusia howled once more. Nostrand aimed his blaster at the giant arthropod, recognizing that a shot would do little except piss the thing off. Sorry, buddy. It'll only hurt for a second, he said, and they both fired quickly, two shots each into its scaled upper body. It was enough. The Solarusia screamed, thrashed, smashing and straightening itself toward the threat as Nostrand ran from the vestibule, pulling Mia out of the way in the nick of time while the guards rained fire at the couple. At the massive scaled leg smashing through the wall near the observation platform, Mia and Nostrand ducked down, rolling behind a row of sleep cabinets. The sheer force of the beast crushing the structure of its pen and all that surrounded it was sufficient to disengage some universal trigger, unlocking all the test subject cages in the laboratory simultaneously. In seconds, the room was all fur and scales and gnashing teeth, as many of the animals jumped at freedom, also fleeing the wrath of the solar Rusia. Executing panic mode, the guards laid every ounce of fire they had toward the creature, only as more legs came splintering through, reaching out in fury at anything they came in contact with. They punctured the exterior matter. <laughs> punctured the exterior. 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 Metal of the facility, creating snags and sharp splinters, turning the lab and the room surrounding it into the equivalent of a busted tin can. One of the thing's legs took hold of a guard, curling around its body as the beast ignited into an angry red flush. The guard convulsed, electrified, dropping to the ground with a clang and a shudder. No strand and Mia saw their moment to get out as the beast's head smashed through the open space, rearing its scaly crop back to give a numbing shriek an unhinged jaw wide open and oozing. Mia held her blaster at the ready toward it while they ran beneath one of so many legs, avoiding the stiff hairs that covered it. Just beyond the angry teeth, where the solar had pierced through the exterior of the structure, no strand could see the skull and amber sky of the planet. He begged the universe to let them make it back to the ship. They ran as fast as they could, dodging a sea of passing exotic creatures and falling panels of metal, and the group of guards that had all but forgotten about the intruders amidst the far more demanding loose leviathan unleashed upon them. The two went out the way they came, into the vaporous exhaust hatch. Expeditiously, their limbs carried them down the ladder, nearly flying, blood racing at record time through tracks of veins. Nostrand made sure Mia hit the ground running, staying close behind and dropping from the pipe in sharp time, with a blistering cloud of exhaust let out from the main duct. It was so hot that the steam melted the fibers of his glove, the one that he'd been holding on with as he jumped, into a stiff sort of cuff for his hand. A millisecond longer, and Nostrand would have well been a heap of soup bones. A hundred feet away, a ship with two broad rectangular wings like dripping black paint waited for them, swooping low on the horizon to drop a hoisting device. Mia and Nostrand locked into the hoist, staring at the crippled superstructure blankly. Dark smoke billowed from a dozen different points in the distance as the Solarusia moved through the side of the research facility, fleeing its captors. A flow of creatures followed suit and poured out into the golden crochet sand. No strand knew many of them were tasting freedom after so much time in captivity. Perhaps it was their first taste of it. He hoped it was as sweet as he remembered. The structure began to cave in just as the hoisting device pulled them to the waiting refuge of the Rix and Freckle. On the flight deck, a sizable white droid with a thick stripe of automation ran down his arched top, struck a few keys of code to close up the bay. The freckle tilted somewhat sharply toward the abyss, the tail of the ship curling up and under, a winged insect tucking its stinger as it flew out of harm's way. Arc 51 didn't turn to greet Mosh and Mia, but rather, 
shook his oversized robotic finger at them from over his shoulder. According to my extensive data collection, what's that? <laughs> Punctuality is an excellent trait, the droid reasoned. Have either of you ever considered it? That's funny, 51. We would have been back on time if we didn't almost die eight different ways in the 15 extra minutes it took us to get here. No strand said exhausted. Not that you've ever been in the face of actual combat of any kind. Despite all the dirty, terrible things we had to do in order to upgrade your systems to be a full-on super soldier. Arc 51 finally turns his headpiece around, 180 degrees, focusing in on Nostran and Nia via a single ocular lens at his center. And caretaker, he said, a tone in his voice that some might categorize as sanctimonious, though it was only truly not intended in the slightest. Nostran couldn't help but chuckle. 51 was nothing, if not earnest, and he wasn't aggravating them with his obsessive attention to detail. His authenticity was charming. The nose of the ship broke through the atmosphere, cracking cleanly into the glittery murk of space. Art 51 looked back and forth at them, noticing as Nostrand cut the metal glove from his cracked hand. Well then, to that end, I will suggest we chart a random pathway to remain out of sight for some time in the event any systems are trying to track us. He turned back to the deck and began pattering out a flight plan as he spoke. Did you acquire the pharmaceuticals? I would indeed find it wise to begin the decrypting process. I will need to narrow down which is the one we've been looking for based on protein structure classifications and molecular element makeup, and that could be a lengthy conversion depending on how many... Check the bags, 51. Mia handed her pack to the droid, lovingly patting his back as she breathed by him. He always spoke too much. Is he awake? Indeed, I've put him to bed. But I believe he always waits up for you. Mia smiled and Nostran walked alongside her down the short hallway to the large stateroom on the left where a small child, a boy, no more than five years old or so, was tucked into the soft blue cover of a little bed, his eyes unnaturally white and filmy, gaze transfixed ahead of him to the trio of windows showcasing the shadowed stretches of the universe. He watched and watched without flinching, without motion, as if his own stillness might make way for the darkness of space to divulge its secrets. He may have been quite aware that his mother and father entered the room, but he gave no indication. Silent, unmoving. Nostrand felt a haze of calm surround him as Mia sat down on the bed beside the boy, running her hand over the quiet forehead of her beloved son. The child stared never left the windows, never moved at all. One of his feet extended out from the sapphire blanket, and Nostrand waited for Mia to take notice. On nights that our 51 tucked him in, the droid worried the child might get too warm and would be unable to pull the blankets off of himself, given his condition. Conversely, Mia was afraid he might get cold and always bundled him up. Nostrand watched Mia's long fingers as she cradled the boy's foot softly at the ankle. He marveled a moment at the gap between his second and third toe, a few centimeters too wide, short toes, just like his own, before Mia tucked the child fully beneath the blankets. The couple watched his chest rise and fall, silently finding comfort in the cadence of his heart beating. It was a language they all understood, this family. This soundless, still, perfect boy they loved more than their own lives. Baxis, she whispered, we're home. Yeah.